Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, I'd first like to thank Fabrizio for organizing this talk uh, through Open Neuromorphic. You may or may not have heard of um, this cult where uh, just a bunch of people join a Discord server and 90% of it is technical uh, neuromorphic chat and support and just a little cute community and the 10% is degenerate memes. Um, so you can go ahead and scan that if you wanted to join that fun. Uh, next slide, yeah, so that's pretty much more or less what it is. Got a bunch of upcoming talks. There's a website, you can look at it, all well and good. Next. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I'll briefly introduce Conrad. I don't think he needs an introduction, but he's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in computational neuroscience. He's a co-director of the CFAS LMB program. And he is one of the reasons that the Neuromatch Academy, which I think many of you are familiar or have even done, uh, is going on. It's effectively this free and somewhat amazing course that has democratized the computational neuroscience and deep learning uh, material and content, um, basically training up a whole generation, which is goddamn amazing. Um, he's going to be talking about does the brain do gradient descent? He has invited everyone to. Uh, question and interrupt and have a have a to, to, to say whatever you want, call out and make it as uh, interactive and lively and controversial as you wish. So, with that being said, Conrad, take it away. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Let's put um, put up some slides. Um, of course, it's much much more fun giving a talk with just uh, chalk, but um, I trust that you see my slides. Today oh, I'll be talking yeah, about. Sorry, not yet, not yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't. Sorry, we don't see. I also don't see them. Have you tried turning it on and off again? Share your screen, please. Okay, let's try again. Share. Now you should see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. It's, on, it's not on the presenter view, so it's on a uh, your editing. Okay, we perfect. Okay. We got it. How's that? I, I, don't, I don't need presenter mode. Presenter mode is only for people when I give good talks. I'm perfectly happy giving a mediocre talk. Absolutely. And for that, I, it's, it's absolutely enough if I see the same slides that you're seeing. So today I want to talk about does the brain do gradient descent? And if so, how? Um, this is weird. You now, like the brain is basically a big meatball full of kind of like signals traveling all over the place. Gradient descent is like this cool thing that the deep learning folks do. How and why could the two of them be doing something similar? And I want to make arguments at multiple levels here. I want to make arguments at the microscopic level where we can argue, look, what's going on here is at least compatible with the neurons doing something like gradient descent. I want to make arguments on the normative evolution level, which is if the brain could discover the gradient descent, it would be incredibly useful from an evolutionary perspective. And therefore we should kind of expect the brain to do something like gradient descent. So it's a very multifaceted talk and I'm sure I will deviate from like a clean path through this space. So please interrupt me when like anything doesn't feel like it's agreeable. So could the brain do something like backpropagation of error? Now, backpropagation is one algorithm that does one thing. What does backpropagation do? Well, it uses backpropagation to calculate the gradients and then it goes down the gradients. Not like it, backpropagation is just one algorithm of doing gradient descent. So let's take those two apart. There's backpropagation and there's gradient descent. The two of them aren't the same. Um, when I ask, does the brain do something like backpropagation or gradient descent? I'm not necessarily saying that it implements that exact algorithm. I mean something that's more humble and we'll get to that in just a slide or so. So let's first talk about what do I mean when I talk about learning? Anything is learning. For me, learning just means that we have parameters in a system, let's call them W, and these parameters change. Delta W, 
So the new weights are now different, or like the new parameters are different. Now, what is W? W is anything that we have in this big meatball in our heads. Not like that is the synaptic weights and it's the time constants of them. And it's the probability of release of stuff. And it's the density of calcium channels and sodium channels and you name it. It's basically all the parameters that we have. If something happens to you, you see me give the talk, your weights will be different, or like your parameters. And when I say weights, I mean all the parameters. Your parameters will be different after seeing the talk than there before. For example, you'll memorize the talk. The talk will probably have like changed how like some of your things go in the brain and all kinds of things will change. Okay, let's talk about learning algorithms. Back propagation of error is one learning algorithm. Fabian learning is another learning algorithm, not like delta W is A pre times A post times a, little, a small little constant. Incidentally, Habian learning um, converges to the largest singular vector of uh, the input distribution. The economy is a learning algorithm. Not like that, that, let's be clear about the scope of what I'm talking about. The economy is lots of people doing lots of things, not like they write papers, they get paid for being employed somewhere where they get employed for writing papers. All of that is a learning algorithm. There's parameters to that, the parameters change. Incidentally, the field of deep learning itself is a learning algorithm, not like how do people choose the papers they work on? And we have a fun paper that I can't talk about today but that argues that the best way to understand the field of deep learning is just assume that it basically is an evolutionary algorithm that tinkers with stuff to get better. And you can then use modern evolutionary theory to ask under which circumstances such a field will be most effective. And it's just like follow standard modern um, evolutionary theory. It's a joint paper with Artem Katznashev. Now, Learning is, is all good. Learning just means change. Learning means dynamics. But there's something deeper that we mean with learning. Now, like you wouldn't say if just something randomly changes. Now, like if, if we have a little warm stone and like one of the, uh, of the atoms moves position, it doesn't quite feel like that's what we mean with learning. No, and for learning, we usually have this, it's called teleological thinking or normative thinking, where we say the learning system has some direction where it's going. It's trying to get better at something. Now, how, how does that match with what we know about learning? Well, people usually, when they interact with stuff, they get better at the things they care about. You know, like I give a talk, I totally botch it. People tell me, Conrad, this was horrible. Hopefully next time I'll show up, give a better talk. Same thing, I like play some, some spots. I miss my target, I will be different next time. And, and a lot of my older research from my lab deals with Bayesian models of how we might be learning and adapt, adapting things. Same thing with the economy. Now, like the economy generally gets better at providing us with stuff. That's a reason to think about it in a way as a learning system. It's not just that change happens. It's change happens into a given direction. Not always, same thing with the brain. Not like you sometimes screw up worse than you screwed up in the past. But on average, if we do things often enough, we kind of tend to get better at stuff. And the deep learning field generally gets better at dazzling us with sweet, sweet chatbots. Every couple of weeks, there's a new chat box, but and they're incredible. And in fact, I think every, I mean, this is a total aside, but I think that using chatbots well is something that promises to make the field and teaching and kind of all the things we intelligent workers do more efficient. And I do think that we all should learn how to use it effectively. That includes the good things. What is it very good at? What are chatbots really good at? And also the things that they're really bad at. But I do use ChatGPT on a daily basis. And no, this talk was not entirely written by the chatbot, even if it might feel like that at times. Um, but all those things clearly get better at the things that they're learning. Machine learning algorithms also get better at the thing they're learning. So let's see why this is happening. <laughs> 
under which circumstances does the learning algorithm make us better? Well, the change in loss, not like you can say lots of problems in the real world, they're kind of locally smooth. They're at least smooth if we consider that kind of everything's very noisy in the world. So if I change my policy just a little bit, I do things a little bit different then you can say this little bit that I do things different. It probably lies kind of for the relevant loss functions in kind of a relatively smooth space. Now, like uh, the probability that I'm gonna die today isn't gonna like be very strongly affected by like the next sentence, what's in the sentence that I have. So, um, and given that all of that all, everything is very random and happens much later, it's arguably gonna be smoothed out. And that's one of uh, one general observation, noisy systems become smooth. This is something that people also misunderstand about machine learning. If your data is really bad, then a linear system is gonna be the best system you can have because as we add more noise, to, more noise to a system, the best solutions kind of become all linear in all but a very, very unlikely set of scenarios. So algorithms make short, small changes. If we are in that region where we can where we can view it as locally linear, then what's the improvement that we have? Well, it's delta W times the gradient after W of the loss function that we have. Why is that in high dimensional spaces? These things are all independent. In by effect, as long as we just move locally, the coverage does nothing. It's just like all the local changes just have the effect that, uh, that you can decouple it basically. It's as if you do independently and so, uh, move into the direction. So that means that we can calculate how much a given change makes us better at things. And it turns out that there's only one big useful thing that we ever found and we'll get to that. So let's talk about backpropagation. Now, what is backpropagation? The backpropagation of, algor of error algorithm, also gradient descent. Now, backpropagation is a way of calculating the gradient. There's lots of ways of calculating the gradient. On this slide, it says backpropagation, it prob probably should say gradient descent. Now, what does gradient descent do? We change the weights by a small constant eta times the gradient after L, and that's a minus because loss is something we want to minimize. What's the improvement that we have here? It's simply the product of the weight change that we have, delta W times the gradient. And there should probably be a transpose in there, but I've always been bad at getting transposes and signs correct. Sorry, uh, no, let's, was there a question? The sign is correct, right? <laughs> um, I, I do hope the sign is correct. <laughs> But, uh, but but the sign might just as well be wrong. So, but let's let's first see why does backpropagation help? Backpropagation or gradient descent helps because the 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 loss goes down by minus eta times gradient of the loss function transpose times the gradient of the loss function. Okay, that shows that basically uh, gradient descent always makes us better, and that is amazing if you think about it. You know, like. We now have an algorithm that kind of regardless of what's going on is gonna make us better. It's the only thing that we like, the only really, really big thing we ever found out in machine learning. Like how do we solve problems? We give them lots of parameters and then we move all parameters kind of into the right direction. And as long as we do that with enough parameters, we're kind of doing the right thing. And that's of course like a deep theory that we write over it and lots of tricks that make it a little bit better. But the big idea that's behind kind of all of machine learning is like, hey, let's find a way of like making it better and do that on enough axis at the same time and will be pretty amazing in very little time. So that's why gradient, uh, why backpropagation or gradient descent works. So let's find out what's special about it. You know, like it turns out that there's an infinite set of algorithms that make us equally better within that local region, which is we need to go gradient descent is like the steepest descent place where we go down, but then we can on the orthogonal axis of it, move as far as we want into whichever direction. Like the improvement is not affected by that. So of all the algorithms that get us better by a fixed amount, what's special about gradient descent? Well, it's the one that least messes with the weights. It's the shortest path in the weight space that gets us to have some level of improvement. I should say 
So, so here you can say it kind of comes from like a very intuitive idea, which is when we want to launch something, let's not change the weights unnecessarily. Why is unnecessarily changing weight a, weights a problem? Well, we kind of learn lots of things interleaved one after the other. If we mess with all the other weights, we'll probably destroy some things that we learned for other situations. No? So we really want to have like that minimal intervention idea. Now, of course, everything has details. So minimal intervention idea here in gradient descent is don't change the weights unnecessarily. I Arguably, that's not what we want to do. We want to minimally change what the system does from its inputs to its outputs. There's an alternative called natural gradients. Uh, it, uh, the goal is it should mess least with the I.O. function. There's a new paper by Walter Sen and his group uh, that talk about spiking neurons and how they could be doing something like that. There's a big literature in neuroscience that argues that natural gradients are much better for lots of things. Why do we not use natural gradients so much? Well, natural gradients kind of force us to approximate the Hessian matrix. The Hessian now is unfortunately, you know, like we're talking about big systems with lots of parameters, N weights. The, the, the Hessian, of course, has N squared entries. So it's kind of a really big matrix. And it's very hard to do anything with it. In particular, we most certainly don't want to invert it. So that is why kind of like, despite the fact that natural gradient descent is like in lots of ways preferable to backpropagation, we generally don't. And there's lots of ways how we can view tricks that people use in deep learning at the moment as ways of pushing backpropagation just a tiny bit into the direction of gradient descent. So, um, um, people thought about lots of simple solutions, you know, like um, reward modulated Hebbian thing. There's all kinds of these approaches. Unfortunately, all these like wonderful, little, beautiful biological solutions by themselves have the property that they don't optimize the loss function in the end. So as soon as you build more complex systems, kind of things get badly wrong. And so they don't generally work. It's also like of those that do work, you know, like you can say there's a first class of algorithms that don't work, which is, let's say the weight change is, this is an equation. The probability that you correctly guessed the correct gradient, as long as it's a non-trivial system is zero. The probability that that thing makes converges against something that you really doesn't want it to converge to is one. Trust me, I tried, that's what I did a good part of my PhD thesis. Whenever I said optimize objective function, I get great results. Whenever I said, uh, oh, here's a, here's a learning rule, let's run it. Bad things happen in surprising ways. So that is the first class of things that don't work. If you try and like guess what biology should be doing, like, oh my God, like not a sliver of hope. There's another set of things that don't work is we can have algorithms that provably do gradient descent, but do that arbitrarily slowly. And it's a little bit of a shame. So in biology, anything that has a measurement counts. It's an argument. If you're like, someone measured X and therefore I don't like your theory, totally valid, everyone in biology is happy with it. But if you say your algorithm converges exponentially slower than that other algorithm, therefore there's no sliver of hope that your algorithm could be what biology con converges against. They're like, okay, now that's not an argument that we're happy with. Let me make that argument nonetheless because it's a correct argument and one that's arguably stronger than a lot of arguments made in biology. So this is a wonderful paper by Sebastian Song, Ila Fiete and others. It's kind of a fog first one that does that. So this is an algorithm that can be proven to do gradient descent on average. How does it work? You take all the synapses and you make it that sometimes the synapse just doesn't work. It's called failure of transmission. It's just like the, the, the action potential comes and the synapse does absolutely nothing. And the idea is then the when it happens, the, the neuron keeps a record of that. It's basically, yes, there was like a spike and a calcium signal coming into it. And at other times like, no, we didn't do that. And the idea now is 
that we produce an eligibility trace, probably some molecular cascades in the synapses that tracks that. And then the idea is that we get the reinforcement learning signal H. And what I told you so far, this would be called minus L. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. It just says success or not success. That's the thing that we want to optimize. And then you could say um, when it was released and it leads to a reward, it meant that if you want the synapse did something and it was good. If it's released and it doesn't lead to reward, it means the synapse did something and it didn't work. Now, on average, this calculates gradients. How? You can say with synapse, what's the expected reward without synapse? What's the reward? Therefore, delta loss associated with that synapse is the average reward if, yeah, if the synapse is there minus the average reward if it's not, which is just the finite difference approximator for gradient descent. So great, it does gradient descent. Not so great. Let's let's think about it a little bit. We are effectively estimating the gradient, not like like the the weight that we have. We have a delta W. The delta W will have a mean effect, and I think I just convinced you that the mean effect is gradient. Is the gradient, but it also has variance. So let's look at the variance. So the delta W that we introduce on each axis is zero mean and say epsilon variance. You know, like in reality, it's like release or not, but like it, it, we can, given that we have a very large number of them, totally view it as if we do Gaussian perturbations. They happen on all synapses at the same time. So what we do is we then observe F of W plus delta W, the, the changed weight, which is F of W, you know, like that's the same thing, times, and then we have kind of the product of the gradients times the delta W that we did here. What's the variance of that? Well, it's N times epsilon, where epsilon is the noise that we introduce. So now the variance of the delta F divided by the delta W is N which means that if we add more and more synapses, this goes to hell in a basket. You know, like it's so many, sin all the other synapses are also randomly adding noise. Because we have lots of, no of synapses, the output will have lots of variance. And the little variance that I as a synapse contribute to it is entirely irrelevant. And because it's entirely irrelevant, my estimate of how my, what my influence on the output is, is basically just noise. It's worse by a factor n. If I do the same calculation for gradient descent, it has a constant, namely basically the bit depth, depth times how many layers I go through it. So this is factor n more variance. Variance converts to slow. No? I can get rid of the variance by doing it n times. So if I have 10 to the 15 synapses and I do this whole game 10 to the 15 times, I'm as good as if I did a single round of gradient descent. Of course, 10 to the 15 repetitions never gonna happen. So weight perturbation might work, but only in small systems because as soon as you make systems big, everything becomes impossible. So, Question. Yes. I mean, to be fair, um, this parallel perturbation approach is still a square root of n times faster than sequentially perturbing each parameter in sequence, right? It's not n times faster. So if no, you no, do square root of n, square root of n times faster. So exactly in the middle, geometric mean between backpropagation and sequential weight perturbation. I it it depends. No? Like you can say. If you allow me to make a synapse extra strong, I can kind of do the same thing. So, so if you look at the power of the linear estimator, which is important here, the power of the linear estimator has one term, which is the ratio of how many repetitions you have divided by the number of parameters that you have. So in that sense, if you, if you could perturb the individual synapses only by an epsilon, you're absolutely right. If you come, could perturb it by a large effect, then it, it's, it's less problematic. No? Like, and there's an alternative of this, it's called node perturbation, where you perturb the neurons instead of the synapses. And there you kind of have correspondingly, instead of an N synapses, now you have like N neurons, so, so which is much better.
No, but it's it's true. The details is always. But look, square root of n for something like the human brain will still absolutely screw everything. Up. Now, like if you have two learning algorithms in biology, one of which is factor thousand or even factor ten faster than the other one, evolution will solve will get rid of the slow algorithm very quickly. That's the so uh, of the glass half full or half empty, right? So square root of n times slower than gradient descent, of course, that's bad. But square root of n times faster than sequential weight perturbation is definitely good. I mean, it just prepares. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I mean, look, I, I, I like your way of thinking. You know, like what you're basically saying is if we start with biology that does uh, that that does one by one synapse perturbation, we can switch to n in parallel synapse exactly. perturbation. Exactly. Yes. And we do much better in, in the same way, in fact, that we did in biology. Now, like when we probe visual, the visual system, it used to be we go in with an electrode, we have like we have a, a visual stimulus that we kind of like go through line by line to kind of see what it is. And I remember these experiments that people like like literally would be with the cat and like mark where they get a response. And then what did we uh, what happened, like people like Dario Ringach kind of started using like these checker patterns where they did everything at the same time. And because through that, you're basically probing more things in parallel, you're getting a significant benefit from that. And so what you're saying is like basically, yes, evolution should very quickly figure out that it should put up all of them in parallel. Now, if for evolution, there exists someone, something that is a much better approximation to reality, to, to, uh, gradient descent, uh, then node perturbation, uh, or then weight perturbation, then biology should also do that. And you could say evolution then very quickly goes from uh, to perturb all of them, then it very quickly goes to perturb neurons, and then it quickly goes to doing gradient descent, and we'll get at why this is not so, uh, why this is not so surprising. Okay, so, but the important thing is, because of these consideration evolutionarily, a lot of people coming from the deep learning field like look gradient descent is so incredibly useful let's assume that the brain does something like that um let me maybe briefly add the two arguments that are in here that i didn't talk about yet given your question like and a second argument is there's lots of papers that show that for biological realistic things it's very easy to discover gradient descent. It's kind of like there's lots of papers that propose how the brain could be doing gradient descent. And um, and and that, you no, know, like it's the combination of, it would be incredibly useful. And also it seems relatively easy with what we know about biology. And I wanna add a third point here, which is an evolutionary point. Imagine you have a brain that has gradient descent. It can evolve so much faster. Add a new brain area. It works perfectly right out of the box. Imagine if you have a brain that doesn't do gradient descent. What are we gonna do with this new brain area? Should it have a different learning wall? Should it have like a different set of weights? How would we initialize it? How would we choose all those weights? No one knows those things. No, so therefore if you want, there's an evolutionary argument as the biology isn't that difficult and the not doing gradient descent is incredibly difficult now let, let me maybe like put, uh, put a pin a little more into gradient descent is so useful there's lots of algorithms that do gradient descent like things if i say gradient descent i don't mean back propagation where it like goes like exactly the way it went forward all i'm saying is like some algorithm that individually for individual synapses or neurons estimates was this good what this neuron or synapse did or was that bad what it did and the reason why this is so important is an individual neuron can have a positive influence on the behavior or it can have a negative influence if i have a negative influence on what just happened like this was bad and I made it be bad then I should do the opposite thing then this was good and I made it be good so I need to as a as a neuron in a way somehow figure out did I have a positive influence or did I have a negative one because that should flip the direction in which I do plasticity and how that exactly happens we don't know to be clear 
But because it's so incredibly useful, I strongly believe that the brain does something like that. And so let's go a little further here. Um, I, I should also say any system that works in the world, take the economy, take, take ecosystems, take, take kind of anything that kind of works in, a, in some meaningful definition of works, we should expect that the system moves into the direction of making performance better. When it comes to the economy, um, this is not part of this talk, but I believe I can describe exactly how it does that with basically money approximating gradients. So everything does gradient descent. Gradient descent is an algorithm that allows the big and complex systems to do the right thing. Therefore, it's tremendously useful for any large and complex system. It solves the coordination problem. Therefore, it will emerge whenever there are incentives to invent it. Now, like I believe that an anthill does gradient descent. I believe that an individual bacterium on its own bio biochemical cascades does gradient descent. And it's very easy to make systems approximate gradient descent. And um, and I should also say, it's clear that there's in systems with lots of actors, there's game theoretic things. I'm not talking about these. And evolutionary biology has very interesting non-optimization based views that I'm just, they're just ignoring here. Evolution has like a gradient like thing if you're far away from equilibrium. And then it has a game theoretic situation where you're close to the equilibrium. I'm talking about the first only. Um, now, why is it hard to approximate backpropagation? And let's be clear what I need. If I influence you positively, then the error attributed to you becomes positively the error attributed to me. If I influence you negatively, I need to invert that. Exact sizes aren't so important. It's rather the important things that we go into the right direction. Getting the sizes right isn't so important. So that leads to two prompts. Uh, if we want the brain to do something like gradient descent. The first one is weight transport. Now, like somehow I need to know that I have a positive weight forward or a negative weight forward. The second, but that's something that my downstream neurons decide that I don't decide. It's the learning that happens downstream somewhere that decides that. The second one is multiplexing. Now, like we need spikes on the way forward that tell me this is a person. And at the same time, we need weights on the way back and say like, hey, you said that's probably a person, but like that was wrong. But you need to support those two. And the big difference between all the theories in that space is that they have different proposals for how to do that. Oh, and I should say, um, unfortunately, I don't have a timekeeping device here. If someone could ping me after I run like 50 minutes, uh, that would be great because otherwise I'll be like running too long. So the, the next thing is the quest for realistic backpropagation, like the notion the brain could be doing gradient descent is pretty much as old as the algorithm, as, as the algorithm gradient descent. A learning algorithm for, uh, for Boltzmann machines here with, with Jeff Hinton and Harry very clearly already pushed that. Lots of papers have since. And, like, and let me briefly summarize the very high level state of that field. Has anyone shown that the brain does gradient descent? No, no one has shown at all that the brain does gradient descent or anything like that. What have they shown? There exists a whole literature that says, here are some assumptions about neurons that feel biologically realistic. No? Like here you have a paper by Hinton, Sinofsky, Ackley. Um, there's lots of other papers like that. The papers say, here's some assumptions that feel like biologically realistic. Maybe here's some assumptions that we could build into a neuromorphic system. And here's under these constraints that we give ourselves, we can set up the dynamics so that it does great, that it approximates gradient descent. There's lots of different ideas that people have. Um, the important thing is there's lots of different ways how biologically realistic things can do gradient descent. That's why kind of my starting point into this whole gradient descent thing is assuming that gradient descent is easy. Biology could easily do it. Therefore, we should expect that it like evolved a good approximation to it. So 
Let's talk about the prompts. The first prompt, weight, uh, weight transport. I have some neurons from the left area that go through the middle area with like weights W, zero, and then from the middle area, it goes to the right area, W. Ultimately, on the right-hand side somewhere, we have the loss function. And then loss happens, it gets propagated. And now we need to know that on the way forward, we have W and on the way back, we now need to use W transpose. Basically, if I project positively to you, you need to project back positively to me on the path back. So this, but these must be different synapses. No synapses go in one direction. How, if I have a connection to you, how do you find out that you should be giving me back that connection? And that's the weight, weight transport problem. That's one of the two big problems that people name when they say gradient descent is an unrealistic model of how the brain would do it. So here's a first solution by Lily Krupp, uh, Tweet Lab. Well, what if we just don't make them be the same? No? Like we take some weight forward and we just take some absolutely random other weight matrix B on the way back. It should absolutely not work. But what can I say? This kind of neural network doesn't know that it absolutely shouldn't work. And here's from their paper. We can see that this is it's called feedback alignment. It's basically based on the simple idea, so alarming, the forward connections will kind of start mirroring the backwards connections. So even if we choose everything wrong, it may still go right. And that's what they find here, that basically the weight changes start approximating the gradient and the performance start to be quite similar to the best propagation error uh, algorithm. And it even works on MNEST and on their specific data set, it kind of works even better than backprop. That's not the general finding that people have. If we go to a more complex data set, there's lots of problems that it has difficulty with. But that's the first thing. Like basically, that weight, uh, that that uh, that that uh, weight transport problem may not be such a big problem. It kind of like nothing bad is happening there. And I should say it even works on spiking systems. So you can basically have something that very much is like a spiking neural network, and you just like randomly project it back as if it was an error which you never have, you never calculate the gradients, you just assign them and it still works very well. But then you can say, okay, uh, so we have that system. Um, can we do better? Well, we kind of can, like we can say, if we have something like node perturbation and we don't wanna understand signal propagation, in the entire brain, that's complicated. No one knows what that works. But I just want to know, do I positively influence you or do I negatively influence you? How can I find out about it? Well, what if I would just randomly spike and I do that often, often enough and I see if you're like more active a little after I randomly spiked. Well, it's like no perturbation, it's not optimal, it adds extra noise, but it's much easier than the big problem. I don't need to find out what my influence on that loss that happens much, much later and is very complicated is, I just need to see my influence on my directly post-synaptic neurons. And um, if we do that with node perturbation, indeed, we find that it can considerably help. What you see here is feedback alignment in gray and a certain amount of node perturbation makes things better as we should be expecting here. If you do too much, things go bad because you're basically adding lots of noise. If you do very little, you go back to feedback alignment. So it helps here. And there you can see for autoencoders, for example, um, this does rather poorly. You can see feedback alignment on the bottom left. You see it doesn't look very much like real things. Not perturbation makes it look considerably better. There's more complicated problems where it can help a lot. And I just want to skip over that. It also helps for non-trivial problems like C410 and C400. So for a lot of people, MNIST is a problem that is starting to be too simple. It can be solved in lots of ways. It's, it's kind of not very representative to real world problems. Um, things like uh, C4100 or C410 like are um, more meaningful comparisons there. And uh, you can even give meaningful proofs to that. I want to tell you about the proofs. I want to tell you about the ideas I'm excited. Okay, um, now, do we need spike? Do we need to do random perturbation? It turns out that we don't. No, so let, let, let me give you the logic of that. Um, 
if I compare times where a neuron spiked with times where the neuron didn't spike, everything's totally different, no? Because like the brain will be in a different state, the stimuli will be different, kind of everything's gonna be different. But if I instead compare times where the neuron almost spiked, no, it has this got like to 99% of the spiking threshold and then it didn't happen. Versus those times where I just barely spiked 101% of the threshold. In that case, the two distributions will be similar. In fact, you can prove that if you make that small, they will be identical under relatively harmless assumptions. And if you do that, you can kind of get the same benefits of node perturbation just out of the spiking mechanism. Like every spiking mechanism is implicitly an algorithm that does gradient descent because you can say, well, let's throw everything where it clearly didn't spike or where it clearly spiked. Let's take only everything in an interval of the spiking threshold. And now if I use that, it's a meaningful estimator. Like technically, the words I've been trying to avoid here, it is a correct causal estimator of the causal effect, which happens to be the gradient. So weight transport. The first thing is weight transport uh, part might not be such a big problem. It means if you build a system, maybe in a morph neuromorphic system, and basically you slightly screw up the way gradients propagate backwards, it probably won't matter all that much. Um, and the second one is it might be quite easy to learn with biological hardware or potentially electrical hardware. So the second problem is multiplexing. But you need something. I need to tell you, hey, I think I saw a face there. And then you need to tell me like bad comrade. And this, this loop means that like, but you at the same time need to tell someone else like, oh, there's a face, let's say hi. And kind of but if, you, if, if the language you speak is like, hey, let's say, hi, how can you at the same time, given that there's only one mechanism, also say like, hey, that was bad. Now that, that's difficult. There's like two systems we need to get through that. Now, in some systems, it's relatively easy to see. You know, like in markets, you can say there's money flowing some direction, there's goods kind of flowing into another direction. So in markets, there's very clearly like two currencies. There's like the thing going forward, goods, the thing going back, money. So it's clear how we could multiplex in those systems. What about brains? Um, no, like no one kind of sees those things. Now, there's lots of ideas. There's something that I did for my PhD, which said, well, let individual spikes be like, hey, I see something. And let it be if there's a burst, like we sometimes find these short periods of time. So we have lots of spikes in a fast period of time. They call bus, let them transmit gradient descent. So you can say the average rate of spikes is what I see, the feature that I represent, the average rate of bus is what the gradients are. There exist temporal codes where you could say, I show stimulus and then like it does its wave through the brain and then I have a wave coming back and therefore all the neurons need to do is get basically look at the early piece versus the late piece. There are theories where you can say we have excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons and the excitatory neurons say uh, what I'm transmitting and the balance between excitation and inhibition tells me if this was good or if this wasn't but good. And then there's theories of meta learning where we can say, well, let there not be any one thing, but I basically globally transmit what was good or bad and the individual neurons kind of each of them learn their own teacher. So here's, for example, a paper by Sen and Benjo, where they looked at specific neurons and it's being tested in various experiments at the moment and said it's the balance between inhibitory neurons and excitatory neurons that tells us about the gradients. Um, my own PhD thesis a long time ago was about bus, where you can say a synapse can read it up so, uh, out, so facilitating versus depressing synapses. A lot of top-down connections go to layer one, where the apical dendrite is. A lot of bottom-up connections go to the basal dendrite. And basically, we have the mechanisms that we need to produce these spikes in bus. And I should briefly mention such things can also be built into hardware. Here's a paper by, uh, by my friends uh, Nachi with, uh, from Andrea Leo's group, where what they did is they have a hardware system. And now what they do is they use two copies. Now I told you we have the multiplexing problem. You could use a 
hardware system and use all levers as late while giving the feedback late. What they happen to be doing is they use two identical copies of the hardware system. And then one of them trans effectively transmits, one of them knows what's right versus what's wrong. The other one doesn't. And then the fast long, and then they both learn from the difference that's, that's there. Um, and you can again show that systems uh, systems like that basic you do do gradient descent. This is very similar to um, to the to the equilibrium propagation algorithms that uh, that Bencher has been working on earlier. Um, let's briefly talk about learning to learn. Hold on, can someone tell me what time it is? I'm so sorry. Uh, Eleven twenty. Then what does that mean to you? Um, yeah, yeah, almost fifty minutes. 10, um, okay, we're at 15 minutes. Okay, cool. In that Thank case, I will, I will rather skip over this. We've done experiments with humans where we asked, do they learn which axes are important for the loss functions and which ones are not in a reinforcement learning system? And they do learn how to learn. So in that sense, you can say that lends some uh, some credibility to the idea that somehow the brain figures out and meta learns how it should be learning. Um, learning to learn in neurons. Now you could imagine part of the neurons does the learning and part of the neuron specializes on telling the other part of the neuron how to learn. Uh, take away. Um, arguments for backpropagation is primarily, now like, and I want you to all to know how weak my argument is here. I'm saying, I believe the brain does something like gradient descent because A, it would be so useful. It would be so useful for computation. It would also be so useful for evolution. And it's not ruled out by what we know about biology. In fact, there's like dozens and dozens of proposals of how realistic biology could do it. It turns out that doing the experiments to directly test if the brain does gradient descent is very easy but electrophysiologists don't think in these terms and therefore no one ever tests it, which is really weird because from if you come from this computational side, that's the biggest question that exists. And we're all using radiant descent. It's the biggest single principle in all of machine learning. And yet no one in biology has ever tested for that. The arguments against backpropagation the world has is primarily problems with weight transport and multiplexing neither of which I think are really that big problems. They, so they seem like relatively minor problems. And um, lastly, I think that meta learning, like learning how to learn is one great way with which systems that aren't perfect. And that could be either neomorphic systems or neurons could learn to do really good gradient descent, even if they are built out of like slightly janky hardware that is not perfect. And with that, I want to thank you so much for having me there. This was a delight. Yeah. Any further questions? Yes. So, um, yeah, very interesting talk. Now I'm uh, wondering, so a lot of the intuition really comes from machine learning where you have a single scalar convex objective where the output is like the loss is an instantaneous function of the input and the weights and so on right um in biology timing is also an issue and you didn't mention this as a problem so i'm wondering you have a neuron that spikes at the rate of 10 hertz or whatever and then it is part of some motor movement and then you get a reward five seconds later when you actually drank your glass and now you want to use gradient descent to somehow figure out that the spike like 50 spikes in the past was somehow important for this, right? So to me, actually, the timing seems to be a bigger problem than the than the two problems that you mentioned. So uh, yes, this is, uh, this this is this is wonderful. So so just to make sure that everyone heard the argument. So um, in some cases, we might have immediate feedback, but in a lot of real world cases the feedback happens much later. And therefore it leads to this hard computational problem. Like what of the things that happened ultimately gave rise to that? Um, none of the ever proposed algorithms can do that kind of temporal thing. Um, now, what, what's the set of solutions that people propose for that? So the first one is you can say, I don't necessarily need to wait until I get that feedback. No, I can say I can learn something that says it's going to work. We're on the right path. 
And then I could, that part of the brain could immediately get feedback, even before it happens. And in fact, there you we should mention there exists uh, specialized systems like uh, without uh, certain pieces of the hippocampus you can't solve like these delayed uh, the, these delayed problems. There's multiple structures. There's probably a cerebellar contribution to that as well. But uh, but so so one of them is you can have specialized things that basically allow your feedback system to be in the future. The other one is when I say gradient descent, I don't necessarily mean that as a mechanism you could say maybe that maybe neurons keep a record maybe they're like you know neurons are usually very sparse where you can say the average neuron in cortex only might spike about once a second so but if a neuron spikes heavily they might spike 100 times or something you can so you can say maybe it's a set of events there that a neuron or the network somehow holds on and then you, at a later point of time, do that update. The last thing I wanted to mention is there exists a set of algorithms that are, that, that are in technical use. They're called synthetic gradients. It leads to, it's, it's this problem where you can say, in reality, the problem is much worse than what you just sketched. No, it's not just that the feedback comes in five seconds. The feedback sometimes comes like in five seconds or five minutes or five years. They're like, do you choose a good supervisor for your PhD? <laughs> like your feedback happens much, much later. Um, how do we solve those problems? And people proposed for that something that's called synth uh, synthetic gradients, which is basically you view the gradients itself as a machine learning problem where you have like a learner that kind of says, can I locally estimate if this is good or bad? And then you couple that with something that basically early in your life gives you short horizon problem and then makes these horizons longer through something like curriculum learning. And in those scenarios, like these systems can actually solve that. But but look, this is like arguably the main weakness of all those gradient descent things. But but let me say another thing. So despite the fact that it's, it's totally true that we have that problem, even if we have that problem, we still have that same problem of gradients. And like, who was responsible? That's not something that goes away. And like, we have that problem, how do we bridge time? But then we need to assign it to who was responsible. And we, we see that all over the place where basically, if you look at modern deep learning system, it's, it's not quite as like convex, lost, simple as, as, as you made it out to be like oftentimes our our rewards are really complicated and not everything's differentiable and all those problems and what we always still have is we build then gradient descent systems into systems that are like not gradient descent like where you could say well give me like your best 10 interpretations let's test them but then once you have these systems that kind of are not differentiable they are built out of subsystems that are so in that sense, you really want to have that there. And again, like there's just that strong biological reason. If we want to efficiently search in the space of possible algorithms, we need something like gradient descent to like make sure all the pieces always work properly together. But great question. I mean, like this is exactly the, the vulnerable point of that set of theories. Great. Yes, uh, there is actually a question from uh, the audience, the virtual audience. Um, controversial question. Uh, I like that, by the way. With records to the design of energy efficient hardware, aka neuromorphic computing, is biological aspiration overhyped? What do you think about the airplane bird dilemma? Um, this is a great question. And I very much oscillate between them. So let's start with... What was the question? Sorry. So I'll, I'll, I'll yell out the question again. Um, so with regards to the design of energy efficient hardware, aka neuromorphic computing, is biological inspiration overhyped? What do you think about the aeroplane slash bird dilemma? Yes. So, so again, this is a great question and I'm not sure about it. So there's 
there's arguments that you can make that biology is relatively irrelevant. You know, like give me a list of principles that we use for technical systems today that comes from biology. You will kind of get the same list of 20 things that is basically like folk neuroscience from 30 years ago from most people. It's a small number of exceptions to that, but that's by and large the case. So that's kind of the anti neuron thing. You can go the other direction where you can say, well, let's not ask that question about the history of ideas but like who actually does things and there you can say lots of neuro people make massive impact on the field of neuromorphic engineering and also the field of ai how is it possible that neuroscience this tiny field does so many contributions to ai and you can say there's one weird reason for that which is if i say i do neuroscience then my paper can still be accepted at a computer science conference because it doesn't claim to be state of the art because it's brain science. And therefore, the world gives me a little space. And therefore, I can take the ideas and tinker with it and do some stuff. And then I get soda three years later. And I kind of, it gives me this freedom. And I think this is something that, that might be part of the reasons. The other thing is, Neuroscience has this incredible library of like weird ideas and like you probably all saw Arbib's handbook. Arbib's handbook is like this thick. It's printed on paper so thin you kind of can't even see the paper. It has, uh, it, it has I believe, 300 or 400 theories over the 1200 pages or so that it has. Most of these are completely weird, never, definitely not true, entirely useless theories. But the neuroscientists in those fields kind of can be inspired by these hundreds upon hundreds of theories. And because it doesn't have SOTA as a filter, it kind of allows them to like have that vocabulary. And in that vocabulary are probably lots of things that can still make neuromorphic systems better. So the answer to that is kind of, I can't give the answer. Looking back, it seems that for AI and neuromorphic engineering, having some interest in, neuromorph in neurons seems to be like correlated with people doing awesome things. But is it causal? Well, I don't know. No one ever ran an RCT and I'm not sure about that. But there might be something sociological about it that makes it work. I also think it's kind of worth adding that birds don't have to carry 300 really gassy people, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> and so when you're constrained to silicon that has a fan out of not 10,000, then maybe you do want to keep up the high speed of your electronics rather than working at biological timescales. So it kind of depends on what your ultimate goal is. There's modeling for the sake of modeling, but then there's doing something functional within the constraints of what you've got. Um, I mean, sure, silicon is constrained, but so is the brain, right? The brain evolved in such a way that it was forced to grow in the absence of silicon and uh, floating gates and memories and stuff. And birds can take off right. in complex spaces. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and to be clear, I'm not making the point that we should be running at biological speeds. Like, I think silicon wants to run at a much faster speed than yeah. neurons. That's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and you can say, well, biology just has this weird constraint that everything needs to be made out of little wires that have a characteristic time scale of 10 milliseconds or something. That's a pretty hard constraint. And you can say, well, silicon wires have similar constraints. They're just like many orders of magnitude faster. And that, and therefore, like we need to run silicon things much faster. I, I, I mean, like I'm, I'm totally with you on that. But that doesn't mean that the principles go away. And like the principles might be the same, like that as you make things really dense, you need to bring the compute where the data is. You need to have, you need to use the 3D space. And I mean, like you probably all heard a lot about Krabena's work where he kind of makes the point that we need to have dendrite-like structures in 3D that kind of make the travel distances small because it just scales fundamentally differently. Um, and no, like all those points are very well, very well taken, but like there are different, there are some shared constraints and some different constraints. And, and, and as long as there's shared constraints, there's probably still places where we can be inspired by biology. Yeah, definitely. I think that was one question. Yeah. Yeah. They have a quick question. I appreciate the talk. I think it was very, um, uh, um, enlightening to hear reasoning about all the open problems, but there are many open problems, right? And I'm curious to hear your opinion, Kanan, 
if you're a PhD student now, how would you attack this? You know, what you listed some some things you found interesting. Like, are there anything particular you think will um, help us answer some of these very big questions? Yeah. So 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 look, I think we should do the experiment, and and let me let me sketch for everyone the experiment so that you know that. Um, Gradient descent means that variables in the brain change into the right direction. Okay, let's 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 be clear about how that experiment works. How do I know the gradient of uh, after some loss function, say maybe the one that I use in my experiment after a given neuron? Well, I can run the psychometric curve with and without stimulation of that neuron, and thereby by finite difference differentiation, I get to see the derivative of the loss function after the activity of that neuron. Then I give a learning task. I see how much the activity of the neuron changes during the learning task. If I plot one as a function of the others, everything should lie on the diagonal if the brain does gradient descent. Now, the brain doesn't need to do gradient descent. Now, like, Does it need to be zero degrees, which is what gradient gradient descent does. No. Is 45 degrees fine? Probably. Is like 89.9999 degrees enough? Probably not, because that introduces a lot of noise. But where are we on this thing? No one knows. But but if if we are to find out, we need to find out about those uh, about those values. But I mean, like, look, uh, relevant projects, you know, like, Good gradient descent in neuromorphic systems. That's super interesting. That's super useful. That's, I mean, like, uh, yes, there's at least one company in that space, but but there's relatively little known on how to do that. We wrap it up then. All right. So thanks so much, Conrad. That was very enlightening. Very interesting. And yeah, thanks so much for making the time. Hope to see you in person next year. Oh, wonderful. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Cool. Have a good Thank one. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. Let me stop the recording. Uh, I'll catch you later for a bit too. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>